it is said that Nebuchadnezzar built the hanging gardens of Babylon to remind his median wife, Amiatis, of the green hills and valleys of her homeland. We now pick up the story of Daniel here in Babylon, 53 years after the first vision of Daniel chapter 2. With Daniel aged well into his 70s and weary of his long exile, God provides another dream outlining world events, this time not to the heathen king, but to Daniel himself. In 550 BC, Babylon was weakening and on its way to being overthrown. The changes in world powers were not to take God's people by surprise. Daniel was to know that God is in charge of the affairs of this world and will give his people an expected end. After the death of Nebuchadnezzar in 562 BC, Babylon went through a quick succession of five kings in 12 years. The first king was Nebuchadnezzar's son, Amil Marduk, who was assassinated after two years' reign. The last was the co-regency of Nebuchadnezzar and his son Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. Belshazzar had been put in charge of Babylon as co-regent, while Nebuchadnezzar spent many years in northern Arabia. Around 550 BC, the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon's reign, the prophetic vision of Daniel chapter 7 was given. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion, and an eagle's wing. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and the man's heart was given to him. And behold another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth, devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of man, and a mouth, speaking great things. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Powerful imagery and strong symbolism are here used to foreshadow the events that affect the people of God. The pictures of bloodshed and slaughter, the beasts devouring, caused Daniel stress and sickness, he declared. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. Looking forward to the time his people could return back to Jerusalem and longing for the end of the 70 years captivity as prophesied by Jeremiah 
only sees centuries and centuries of ongoing war and bloodshed as kingdom rises after kingdom. Keen to understand the truth, Daniel approaches an angel of God. According to the evidence in Daniel chapter 8 and 9, it was most likely the angel Gabriel. Daniel simply asks for an interpretation. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. The beauty of the first few prophetic visions of Daniel is that God provides the interpretation. This enables us to identify the foundation of prophetic interpretation and gives us the groundwork to unlock the symbols and themes contained in the books of Daniel and Revelation. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. This vision of the four beasts, the diverse horns, and the establishment of God's everlasting kingdom runs in direct parallel with Nebuchadnezzar's dream 53 years earlier. Four metallic parts of the image, a time of division, and the setting up of the everlasting kingdom as represented by the stone. A powerful teaching method is here used. Repeat and enlarge. God has used this principle throughout Scripture, and it will only become more distinct as we travel through the prophecies. As a whole, Scripture should be taken literally, unless there is clear reason to take it symbolically. However, that which is symbolic must be interpreted by that which is literal. For example, the symbol of the Lamb represents the literal Messiah, Jesus Christ. The angel is clear in defining the symbolism of the beasts as ruling kings or kingdoms in which warfare is their method of conquering. However, the conclusion is that the literal people or saints of God will rule. An unlikely twist seeing no physical warfare is used on their part. What a thrilling vision, what a privilege it is to have access to these prophecies. Let us dive in and seek to understand this neglected book. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. The symbolism of four winds has been used in the Old Testament, especially in the writings of Jeremiah. Flee, get you far off. Dwell deep, for Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, hath taken counsel against you, and hath conceived a purpose against you. And upon Elam will I bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and will scatter them toward all those winds. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies, and before them that seek their life. And I will bring evil upon them, even my fierce anger, saith the Lord. Daniel was a keen student of Jeremiah, and would have understood the meaning of the four winds, as King Nebuchadnezzar had fulfilled that very prophecy. So according to scripture, literal war, strife and commotion are symbolized by the winds. The Bible is very clear as to the meaning of seas and waters, as recorded in Isaiah and Revelation. Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas, and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sowest where the whore sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. As the winds of strife, war, and commotion blow upon multitudes of people, races, and nations, four diverse kingdoms rise and impress their stamp on world history. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The angel has already explained that these beasts are kings. However, the angel gives further interpretation by the request of Daniel in verse 23. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. This time the angel uses the word kingdom as the interpretation of the beasts. So these four beasts represent kingdoms. There have been thousands of kingdoms over the course of earth's history, each with a different ruler, territory, styles of government, Yet God has chosen only these for their unique characteristics and influence on the earth. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. To Daniel, the identity of the first beast was relatively obvious. Jeremiah had already divinely described a lion-like kingdom in prophesying of the destruction of Jerusalem. Declare ye in Judah 
and publish in Jerusalem, for I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. The lion is come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate, and thy city shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. As gold, the king of metals was used to symbolize the Babylonian kingdom in Daniel chapter 2. So chapter 7 uses the lion, the king of beasts, to enlarge the same timeline. The use of beasts to symbolize nations is common. Even today, there was absolutely no mystery to Daniel regarding the winged lion. Historical records even show rulers of Babylon adopted the winged lion to represent their kingdom. To Daniel, this image was clear. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked. Although a student of the prophet Jeremiah, Daniel was also familiar with the prophet Habakkuk, who was an early contemporary of Jeremiah and active in his work while Nebuchadnezzar and his father were rising to power around 612 BC. Habakkuk complained of the evils of Israel, to which God gives a clear response. He would use Babylon to conquer and punish Israel, and in doing so gives us an indication of the meaning of the eagle's wings. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. Their horses also are swifter than the leopards, and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. Within thirty-four years, Babylon swiftly rose to its height under King Nebuchadnezzar. This swiftness was represented by the wings. By 572, Nebuchadnezzar was in full control of Babylonia, Assyria, Phoenicia, Israel, Philistinia, Northern Arabia, and parts of Asia Minor. From that time onwards, Babylon ceased enlarging its borders. Astagus had taken the throne in Media, and his two sisters were married off, one to the Lydian king Creusus, and the other to Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar then ceased his military campaigns and turned his attention to beautifying the city, which is aptly represented by the wings being plucked off. After securing his empire, which included marrying a Median princess, he devoted himself to maintaining the empire and conducting numerous impressive building projects in Babylon. He is credited with building the fabled Hanging Gardens of Babylon. A change had occurred in the Babylonian kingdom. No longer a fierce predator flying upon its prey, Babylon was to fall into complacency and indulgence. It was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man. Habakkuk prophesies Babylon's sudden change. Pride and arrogancy only known in the human heart would be Babylon's downfall. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, and they shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power unto his God. Nebuchadnezzar became one of the richest and most powerful men on earth. The Bible testifies of the pride and power that led him to seven years of insanity at the hand of God. Although secular history remains silent regarding the insanity of Nebuchadnezzar, the Bible is clear. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon? that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. While Nebuchadnezzar was restored to power, and humbled himself under the king of heaven and earth, as recorded in Daniel chapter 4, the wings of the kingdom had been clipped. A change of heart had occurred. Wealth, luxury, and power led to pride, arrogance, cruelty, and oppression. The succession of Babylonian kings never acknowledged the God of heaven, instead imputing their power unto themselves and their gods. A short time after this vision was given, in the year 539 BC, Daniel is witness to the complete overthrow of the kingdom. Babylon's pride and arrogance culminated with Belshazzar. Belshazzar commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, 
They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. The writing was on the wall. King Belshazzar had no brave lion heart. The record declares his loins were loosed. His knees shook in fear. Some scholars believe the loosening of the loins to mean he could no longer stand due to the weakening of the hip joints. Yet others believe it to mean he became incontinent. Either way, we know great fear came upon the king. The prophecy of Isaiah regarding Cyrus the Persian is striking. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Following this, Belshazzar called all his spiritualistic wise men, offering great rewards of power and wealth to any who could translate the writing. His mother, the queen, tells him of Nebuchadnezzar's experience, and Daniel was called. He offered him great rewards and honours. Daniel had a swift reply. Let thy gifts be to thyself, yet I will read the writing unto the king, and make known to him the interpretation. O thou king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom, and majesty, and glory, and honour, and thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. And this is the writing that was written. Mini, mini, tekel, eupharsin. Mini, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Babylon had been irreconcilably altered to follow the lusts of an evil heart, fulfilling the symbol of a lion standing like a man with a man's heart. It was during this night of revelry the armies of the Medes and Persians entered the unguarded city of Babylon. Babylon embodied the religious beliefs and practices of ancient Mesopotamia and considered itself as the gateway to the gods. Throughout Bible prophecy, this kingdom is used to symbolize the enemy power that wars against God and his everlasting kingdom. Behold another beast, the second, like to a bear. At this point, it should be obvious which power the bear represents. Like silver is to gold, so the bear is inferior in majesty to the lion. The mountain dwelling bear is large and awkward, yet powerful. Notice the prophecy given at least 50 years earlier by Jeremiah when describing the attributes of the kingdom to follow after Babylon. Then the heaven and the earth and all that is therein shall sing for Babylon, for the spoilers shall come unto her from the north, saith the Lord. A sound of a cry cometh from Babylon, and great destruction from the land of the Chaldeans, because the Lord hath spoiled Babylon and destroyed out of her the great voice. When her waves do roar like great waters, a noise of their voice is uttered. The prophet describes a kingdom arising from the north out of the noise of war roaring like great waves of water. Notice further attributes given at least 150 years before by the prophet Isaiah. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them. The scriptures describe large mountain-dwelling nations unifying to bring Babylon to its knees. The Medes settled in the northern Zagros Mountains, while the Persians settled to the south. The Median Empire stretched across the Iranian plateau as far as the ancient kingdom of Lydia in Anatolia, or the center of modern day Turkey. The Medes and the Persians were of one tribal root. 
It raised up itself on one side. The description of the bear with one side raised up above the other symbolizes the relationship between Media and Persia. From 625 BC to 550, the Persian kingdom remained subservient to Media during the reign of Kings Cyaxares I and Astagus. In 550 BC, Cyrus the Great revolted against the Median lordship and dethroned his grandfather, Astagus. King Astagus called up his troops and marched against Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to meet him in battle. The army of Astagus revolted against him, and in fetters they delivered him to Cyrus. Cyrus marched against Ecbatana, the royal residence he seized, silver, gold, other valuables of the country, Ecbatana he took as booty and brought to Persia. From 550, the Persians presided over the Medes. However, they had a special status within the Persian Empire, not only because they were similar peoples racially and linguistically, but also because Cyrus had both Median and Persian bloodline. And it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. When Cyrus took over the Median Empire and united the Iranian kingdoms, there were four major powers in the region, Medo-Persia, Egypt, Babylon and Lydia. The kingdom of Lydia occupied the ancient region of Anatolia, with its capital in Sardis. Croesus, king of Lydia, was renowned for his wealth and is credited for issuing the first true gold coins with a standardised purity for general circulation. Croesus became unhappy with the increase of Persian power in Anatolia. He consulted the Delphic oracle who told him that if Croesus attacked the Persians, he would destroy a great empire. Croesus assumed the Great Empire was referring to the Persians. In 546 BC, Cyrus defeated Croesus in the siege of Sardis and annexed Lydia into the Persian Empire. Six years later, in 540 BC, Cyrus annexed Elam, while Babylon began retracting. The Persian and Babylonian armies engaged in a battle in 539 BC near the strategic riverside city of Opus. The Persians had a decided victory in the Battle of Opus and went on to take the Babylonian city of Sippa without resistance. The weakening line was helpless as the devouring bear of the Medo-Persians diverted the river, marched under the wall and took the city of Babylon. Cyrus returned to Media and met with his aged uncle Darius the Mede, also known as Cyaxares, son of Astagus, and allowed him rulership in Babylon. And now when the march had brought them into Media, Cyrus turned aside to visit Cyaxares, Darius the Mede. After they had met and embraced, Cyrus began telling Cyaxares that a palace in Babylon and an estate had been set aside for him. Cyrus died nine years later in 530 BC, leaving the empire to his son Cambyses II. Egypt was the only remaining independent nation in the region, and the new Persian king was eager to take control of Egypt. In 526 BC, a new pharaoh ascended the throne of Egypt, and within six months, early in the year 525 BC, Cambyses marched against Egypt and defeated Pharaoh in the Battle of Pelusium. Medo-Persia consumed three major independent kingdoms in establishing the Archimedean Empire, as symbolised by the bear with three ribs in its mouth. The three ribs being Lydia, Babylon and Egypt. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. The command given to the bear to devour much flesh gives us some insight behind the veil of earthly powers. It shows that someone is actively behind the scenes, guiding the history of this world. One higher than Cyrus gave him permission to conquer. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me. Persia commanded some of the largest armies ever assembled. Persia became the largest empire the world had yet seen, reaching its height under Darius the Great. It has been estimated that over 40% of the earth's population was under Persian rule giving Persia a population of around 50 million subjects. Never before or since had a nation ruled so much of humanity. Like a large bear with an enormous appetite, Persia consumed three major world powers in Lydia, Babylon and Egypt. 
but it also assimilated and incorporated a huge number of vassal and subnational kingdoms, including Elam, Syria, Judea, Nubia, and Cyrenaica, stretching as far as the Indus Valley in the east to parts of the Balkans in the west. The various city-states of Grecia, however, were not given into Persian hands. For nearly 50 years, from 492 to 449 BC, the Persians tried conquering Greece in a series of conflicts called the Persian Wars. After their defeat at Marathon, the Persians went home, but they returned in vastly greater numbers ten years later, led by Darius's successor, Xerxes. The unprecedented size of his forces made their progress quite slow, giving the Greeks plenty of time to prepare their defense. A general Greek league against Persia was formed in 481. The Greek fleet numbered about 350 vessels and was thus only about one-third the size of the Persian fleet. Herodotus estimated the Persian army to number in the millions. Xerxes' forces advanced slowly toward the Greeks, suffering losses from the weather. Like a persistent, ponderous lumbering bear, the Persians did not move with the speed of the Greeks. Their armies moved slowly with massive strength and brute force. The Greeks ultimately conquered Persia despite being grossly outnumbered. The Greeks defeated the Persians with rapidity and agility. Only having approximately 30,000 soldiers, Alexander the Great outmaneuvered and brought down the large Persian forces during the Battle of Gargamela in 331 BC. With Persia now defeated, the principal legacy left behind was the foundation of domination through global economy and worldwide trade. As the leopard uses its acute senses, stealth and speed to pounce on its prey, so Alexander the Great used his military genius to anticipate the strategies of his opponents and his speed to act within small windows of opportunity to defeat his enemies. When Alexander took over the throne of Macedon in 336 BC at the age of 20, he inherited a well-trained and organised army from his father, King Philip II. In the same year, the young king quickly re-established the League of Corinth. The next year, in 335 BC, Alexander secured the northern borders before turning to his main objective. Our enemies are Medes and Persians, men who for centuries have lived soft and luxurious lives. We of Macedon, for generations past, have been trained in the hard school of danger and war. Above all, we are free men, and they are slaves. In 334 BC, Alexander entered Persian territory and defeated the Persians in the Battle of Granicus. He went on to claim victory in the Battle of Issus in 333 BC. In 332 BC, Alexander fulfilled another Bible prophecy, given at the same time Daniel was in Babylon. God foretold through the prophet Ezekiel the fate of Tyre, saying, multiple nations would come against Tyre, starting with King Nebuchadnezzar, and the stones of the city would be placed in the sea where the fishermen would cast their nets. Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come up against thee. I will bring upon Tyrus Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her, and they shall lay thy stones and thy timber and thy dust in the midst of the water, and make her like the top of a rock. It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. Nebuchadnezzar besieged Tyre, so also did Cyrus. But it was Alexander who in 332 BC took the stones and the wood of the old city of Tyre and threw them into the sea to create a causeway over to the new island city, fulfilling God's words which were written hundreds of years earlier. He dismantled much of the old mainland city of Tyre, as well as using fallen debris, rock and felled trees, filling in the sea between the mainland and the island to create a land bridge for his war machines. After taking Tyre, Alexander continued south to take Gaza and Egypt. In 331 BC, he turned his forces to face the entire Persian army near Gargamela. 
Darius chose the flat, open plain of Arbella, where he could deploy his larger forces, not wanting to be caught in a narrow battlefield, as he had been at Issus two years earlier, where he could not deploy his huge army properly. Darius positioned the scythed chariots in front with a group of knights. The cavalry was deployed on two flanks. Bessus commanded the left, Masius commanded the right, with Darius in the center and infantry behind. The Macedonians were divided into two, with the right side of the army under the direct command of Alexander. Alexander's strategic plan was to engage the Persian flanks to open a gap between the enemy lines, through which he could launch a decisive attack in the center against Darius. His plan required a perfect maneuver capability and timing, the Macedonian infantry marched in phalanx formation towards the center of the enemy line, while Alexander led an advance by the cavalry on the right wing to invite the Persian cavalry to attack, while Parmenian's left wing and the second line took up defensive positions. While the Persians were attacking the flanks of the Macedonians, Alexander slowly slid back to his rear guard. The Persians then maneuvered further towards the opening flank and opened a gap between the left wing of Bessus and the center. The Persians at the center were engaged with the Macedonian phalanxes, preventing any attempts to counter Alexander's charge. Alexander ordered his unit to form a giant arrow with him at the tip and advanced on the right wing, rounding to the center. Masius's cavalry broke through the Macedonian lines, only to take the Macedonian camp instead of attacking the enemy from the rear. The reserve phalanx pursued the Persians and attacked them while they tried to loot and raid the camp. Alexander broke through the Persians at the center. The royal guard, Darius, and the Greek mercenaries retreated. Bessus, finding himself separated from Darius, began withdrawing his troops. Masius and the Persian right wing had surrounded Parmenian. As the Macedonian left flank was attacked from all sides, Alexander and his men left the retreating king and engaged against the cavalry of the Persian right. After a heated battle, Masius pulled his forces back, causing the Persians to flee. Alexander was victorious. Darius was ultimately killed by his general Bessus. It is estimated Greece has suffered 1,200 casualties and Persia suffered a loss of 53,000. At the age of 25, Alexander had conquered the largest empire the world had seen, travelled over 6,500 kilometres, all without losing a battle. Over the next 12 years, Alexander annexed the Far East, including parts of India. He travelled a huge distance totaling over 20,000 kilometers as king of Grecia. The leopard is a swift-footed animal, but was insufficient to symbolize the rapidity of the Grecian conquest. So not only two wings as the lion, but four wings were added to the image by God to portray their extraordinary speed. In June 323 BC, Alexander died in Babylon at the age of 32. His death marked the beginning of the Hellenistic age which was the spread of Greek culture, religion and language throughout the empire. With no immediate heir to the throne, the political events and struggles for power after Alexander's death are incredibly complex. I'll give a quick simplified account of the civil conflicts that ensued, known as the Wars of the Successors. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Some of the key players in the struggle for supremacy were as follows. Alexander's widow, Roxanne, pregnant with their son, Alexander IV. Alexander's mentally disabled brother, Philip III. Perdiccas, Alexander's supreme commander. Meliga, Alexander's second most experienced general. Antipater, Alexander's most experienced general. General Leonidas, Alexander's sister, Cleopatra. The champion, Ptolemy. Olympus, the mother of Alexander the Great. General Polypachon, Cassander, son of Antipater, General Antigonus, General Seleucus, General Lysimachus, and there were many more. In the same month of Alexander's death, his generals met together to settle the division of territories to be governed at a conference called the Partition of Babylon. It was decided the unborn son of Alexander 
would be joint king with Alexander's mentally disabled brother, Philip III. Predicus became regent. Alexander's leading generals, senior officers and ruling class were given leadership of the provinces. Predicus ordered the death of Maliga to further secure his position as regent. Greece revolted on hearing the news of Alexander's death and besieged Antipater. Leonidas assisted Antipater to bring Greece under control but died in the Battle of Macedon. Predicus sought to marry Alexander's sister Cleopatra and have Alexander's body transported back to Macedonia to establish his rule. Ptolemy intercepted the body of Alexander while en route and buried him in Alexandria. Predicus attacked Ptolemy in Egypt but was assassinated by his own army. Antipater was appointed regent during the second conference called the Petition of Triparadesis and had the newborn Alexander IV and his mother Roxanne brought to Macedonia. Ptolemy enlarged his territory into Syria. In 319 BC, Antipater fell ill, and before he died, he appointed a general named Polypachon as regent. Disregarding his own son Cassander, Cassander did not accept his father's decision and gained an early victory against Polypachon, taking control over Macedonia. In 317 BC, Philip III, although only considered a figurehead due to his intellectual impairment, was considered too dangerous to keep alive and was put to death by Alexander's mother, Olympus. Antigonus began enlarging his territory and went on to take the largest part of the empire, including Babylon and the Far East. Seleucus fled Babylon and joined Ptolemy in Egypt. Ptolemy gave Seleucus an army. In 315 BC, Lysimachus, Cassander, Ptolemy and Seleucus allied together against Antigonus. Seleucus defeated Antigonus in the Babylonian Wars and took control of the east. In 310 BC, Cassander murdered Alexander IV and his mother Roxanne. Lysimachus then invaded Anatolia and fought against Antigonus. Again in 302 BC, the most powerful leaders of the empire, now kings in their own right, Cassander, Seleucus, Ptolemy and Lysimachus, allied together against Antigonus, who died in the Battle of Ipsus in 301 BC. Cassander would go on to rule Macedonia for 19 years, ultimately founding the Antipater dynasty, followed by the Antigonid dynasty, until being divided by Rome in 168 BC after the Battle of Pydna. Lysimachus ruled Anatolia and Thrace for 20 years until at the age of 80 he died. Philetarius took the throne in Pergamon and established the Attalid dynasty, also known as the Kingdom of Pergamon, which continued until yielding to Rome in 133 BC. Seleucus took the lion's share of the empire, controlling some 3 million square kilometres. After losing the old Persian lands to the Parthians, the Seleucid dynasty was overpowered by Rome in 63 BC. Ptolemy established the Ptolemaic dynasty over Egypt, which lasted 275 years until it fell to Rome in 30 BC. After the assassination of Perdiccas in 321 BC, Macedonian unity collapsed, and 40 years of war between the successors, Diadochi, ensued before the Hellenistic world settled into four stable power blocks, Ptolemaic Egypt, Seleucid Mesopotamia and Central Asia, Attalid Anatolia and Antigonid Macedon. While the Greek territories continued to evolve, history confirms four stable power blocks were maintained until each one fell to the relentless power of Rome. The Hellenistic world continued with as much unity as it had under Alexander, even though it was divided into four regions. How appropriate then this power be symbolised by one animal with four heads. One culture controlled by four individual dynasties that fought relentlessly. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. At this point in the vision, Daniel is sickened by what he saw. No beast found in the animal kingdom has the characteristics to symbolize the nature, aggression and terrifying oppression of this fourth beast. 
The attributes of this fourth beast differed from the previous three. A greater level of detail is given. This beast is shown to continue until the end of time. Daniel inquired to the angel as to the meaning. So he told me, and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. As the angel explained the vision, Daniel understood the meaning of the first three empires. But in his astonishment at the fourth, he requests more information. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. In replying to Daniel, the angel provided even more detailed information. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. At the time of this vision, Rome was a small kingdom, slowly gaining dominance over the Italian peninsula. Little did they know, divine prophecy had foretold that they would become this devouring beast. The Romans changed their form of government from a kingdom to a republic, as Darius the Great began his Greek invasions. Over a 50-year period following 200 BC, Rome went to war with Macedonia, Sparta, the Seleucid Empire, the Gauls from Galatia, the Celts in Spain, and Carthage in North Africa. With victory after victory on every front, the mighty Rome is aptly represented by the beast who stamped their enemies to the ground and broke them into pieces. In 168 BC, in the Battle of Pydna, Rome ended the Macedonian dynasty, but was unable to govern the region. Rome broke Macedonia into four pieces, four confederacies, until it was annexed into Roman provinces in 146 BC, after the Fourth Macedonian War. A Roman coalition gained a victory against the Seleucid Empire in 190 BC, taking control of a large part of Asia Minor. The Seleucid and Ptolemaic kings remained on their thrones, however the enormous beast of Rome cast its shadow over them. The following year, in 189 BC, Rome defeated the Gauls, who had established Galatia. In 181 BC, Rome gained a victory in Spain, and then in 146, annihilated Carthage in the Third Punic War. In 133 BC, the Hellenic Kingdom of Pergamon handed control over to the Roman Republic, knowing resistance was futile. In 188 BC, the Seleucid Empire was forced to pay 450 tonnes of silver to Rome as war reparations. Antiochus Epiphanes ascended the Seleucid throne and attempted to regain power over his weakening empire. He succeeded in a campaign against the Ptolemaic armies, gaining territory from Syria to Alexandria. Like a massive beast watching the triumph of a small boy, Rome approached the Mad King. After crossing the river at Eleusis, about four miles from Alexandria, he was met by the Roman commissioners, to whom he gave a friendly greeting and held out his hand to Pompilius. Pompilius, however, placed in his hand the tablets on which were written the decree of the Senate and told him first of all to read it. After reading it, though, he said he would call his friends into council and consider what he ought to do. Pompilius, stern and imperious as ever, drew a circle round the king with the stick he was carrying and said, before you step out of that circle, give me a reply to lay before the Senate. For a few moments he hesitated, astounded at such a peremptory order, and at last replied, I will do what the Senate thinks right. Antiochus Epiphanes swiftly obeyed the orders from the Roman Senate. He withdrew his armies, giving back the land he just conquered. Like a little boy throwing a tantrum, Antiochus Epiphanes was outraged by Rome denying him his conquest. He returned from Egypt in 168 BC and attacked Jerusalem, executing many Orthodox Jews. When these happenings were reported to the king, he thought that Judea was in revolt. Raging like a wild animal, he set out from Egypt and took Jerusalem by storm. He ordered his soldiers to cut down without mercy those whom they met and to slay those who took refuge in their houses. 
there was a massacre of young and old, a killing of women and children, a slaughter of virgins and infants. In the space of three days, 80,000 were lost, 40,000 meeting a violent death, and the same number being sold into slavery. Antiochus sided with the Hellenized Jews in order to consolidate his hold over the region. He outlawed Jewish religious rites and traditions and ordered the worship of Zeus as the supreme god. Despite Antiochus's best efforts, his kingdom lost prestige and was weakened economically and militarily. After expending much effort dealing with the Jewish revolt and the Parthian invasion in the east, Antiochus died in battle in 164 BC. The Seleucid Empire continued retracting until Rome consumed it in 63 BC. The Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt hid under the shadow of Rome for its last 150 years. Rome needed a constant supply of grain, and Rome was more than willing to take care of the food supply Egypt provided. This alliance ended during the reign of Cleopatra VII. Julius Caesar of Rome assisted Cleopatra during a civil war in Egypt, and they had an affair during the victory parade on the Nile River. Cleopatra bore him a son and named him Caesarian. In 44 BC, Julius was assassinated by the Roman senators, giving power to both Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar's adopted son, Octavian. Cleopatra invited Mark Anthony to a grand banquet in Egypt, which ended in another affair. Antony and Cleopatra then spent the winter of 41 BC together in Alexandria. Cleopatra bore Antony twin children, Alexander Helios and Cleopatra Selina II in 40 BC, and a third, Ptolemy Philadelphus in 36 BC. Octavian engaged in a civil war against Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. History records both committed suicide, and some have said this was the inspiration for William Shakespeare's play Romeo and Juliet. In 30 BC, Octavian ended the Ptolemaic dynasty, and in 27 BC became the first emperor of Rome, commonly known as Caesar Augustus. At this time, Rome settled into a relatively peaceful era, sometimes referred to as the Pax Romana. Augustus was an administrative genius. He commenced reorganisation of the empire, including major tax reforms that required a population census. Because of the emperor's reforms, Joseph and Mary had to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem, which coincided with the time Jesus was born, fulfilling Bible prophecy once again. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Emperor Augustus minted a coin with his inscription and caption claiming to be the Son of God. At the same time, the real Son of God was born. The emperor's impact on this world pales into insignificance compared to the impact Jesus has had. As we will see, this humble, poor man of Nazareth would destroy this dreadful beast. Under the reign of Tiberius in 27 AD, Jesus was anointed at his baptism. He began his public ministry to this world. At this point, it's important to note that while Jesus lived under the temporal rule of Rome, he was planting the seeds of his own kingdom, the kingdom that Daniel saw would replace and have the beast and its horns destroyed. The fourth beast was different from the first three in several ways. Firstly, as it rose to its height, Rome was a republic. Rome also was the first to have a large professional army receiving wages for their service. However, the biggest difference was the fourth beast had ten kings or kingdoms that arose out of it, along with a little horn that arose after. Rome evolved significantly over time, adding different elements and power structures, but maintaining its force on the world. Rome continued relatively unchanged for nearly 300 years, although Rome went through a major crisis in the 3rd century AD. The empire was strengthened and re-established during the reign of Emperor Constantine the Great, beginning in 306 AD. Constantine reunited the empire under one emperor, 
reconstructed the government and carried out military reforms capable of countering internal threats and barbarian invasion. He also introduced a new high grade four and a half gram gold coin throughout the empire to combat inflation. The reign of Constantine marked a distinct shift in the history of Rome. Constantine moved the capital of the empire from Rome to Byzantium, modern day Istanbul, and renamed the city Constantinople. He also legalized Christianity and became the first emperor to convert to Christianity. After the death of Constantine, he divided the empire between his three sons. The move of the empire's capital to Byzantium greatly weakened the western frontier. Only 14 years after the death of Constantine, the western frontier of the Roman Empire collapsed under the force of the Germanic invasions. In the interest of brevity, I will simplify the Germanic invasions of western Rome. For more detail, please refer to our first presentation covering Daniel chapter 2. The great migration of the Germanic tribes was contributed to by the weakening of the Roman frontier and the invasion of Attila the Hun in 370 AD. In 350 AD, the Franks crossed the Rhine and established themselves in Gaul, while the Alamanni settled in the area of Alsace-Lorraine. The Visigoths entered in 376 and ultimately settled in Spain about 466. In 406, the Suvi, the Vandals and the Burgundians passed into Roman territory. The Suvi located themselves in Portugal by 466, while the Vandals settled in northern Africa. The Burgundians spread over Switzerland by 476. As the Roman frontier retreated from Britain, the Angles and Saxons invaded, filling the vacuum by 449 AD. When Attila the Hun died, his large empire practically vanished, giving independence to the tribes once under his control. In 453 AD, the Ostrogothic Kingdom established themselves within the borders of the Roman Empire in the lands of Panania. The Lombards first settled within the Roman territory of Noricum in 453. Lastly, in 475 AD, the Huruli, a rough band of mercenaries and their families, moved into Italy under their king Odoacer. They overthrew the last Roman Emperor, Romulus, in 476, becoming the first barbarian king over Rome. He reigned for about 20 years. When considering the ten horns of the beast, the vision indicates they are separate and individual kings or kingdoms. They must be established in the bounds of the Roman Empire, have a degree of permanency as signified by the roots, and should exist at the same time before the three horns are uprooted. In 476 AD, Rome was divided. Ten kingdoms, ten distinct and independent nations, no more, no less, had fixed themselves within the boundaries of the old Roman Empire. There came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. In this horn were eyes, like the eyes of man, and a mouth, speaking great things whose look was more stout than his fellow. And the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Here we are presented with a power very different from the other horns. Here is the list of characteristics that belong to this little horn power. Let's compare with history to identify its fulfillment. As Jesus lived and ministered to humanity in and around Judea, showing the love of the Father to this world, he was an embodiment of the law of God and the fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham. He developed a spotless human character and he had our sins laid upon him, dying on the cross. After his resurrection, he told his disciples that power over sin and death was his and commissioned them to spread the message of his kingdom to all races, languages and nations, baptizing and teaching the people to obey him. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Jesus didn't just paint a picture of victory and glory. He also clearly warned them 
that his message would cause them persecution. He said, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Christ contrasted the nature of fallen man with the nature of his true followers. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Over the first century AD, the apostles spread Christianity over the Roman world, often meeting outward opposition and persecution at the hands of the Jews and the Gentiles. However, the biggest opposition was not from outside the Christian faith. The apostles clearly spoke of an evil power silently growing in the midst of the followers of Christ. In 50 AD, after Paul and Silas were miraculously released from a jail in Philippi, they travelled to the city of Thessalonica. The city was founded by the Macedonian king Cassander, and he named it after his wife, who was also the half-sister of Alexander the Great. Paul was there for around six months and established a Christian church. During this time in Thessalonica, Paul warned the believers that the end would not come until the power that speaks great words against the Most High would be manifest. In a second letter, he continued his warning by stating this power would try to sit in the place of Christ, which means Antichrist. This power would be a law unto itself and take the worship and name that belongs to God. Paul affirmed the power was already at work, but there was something hindering it from becoming manifest. And as soon as that restraining power was removed, the wicked power would be revealed. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped. So that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The Apostle Paul verbally told the believers who the hindering power was, and reminded them that they already knew. As a Roman citizen, he couldn't make the statement in writing. It is important to know that Paul thoroughly understood the Jewish scriptures, including the visions of Daniel and the rise of the little horn. Evidence from early Christian writers show that Christian believers understood the power that had to be removed before the little horn would be manifest, speaking great words against the Most High. In 200 BC, Tertullian writes the following. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now hinders must hinder until he be taken out of the way. What obstacle is there but the Roman state, the falling away of which, by being scattered into ten kingdoms, shall introduce Antichrist upon its own ruins? Civil and secular authority was the hindrance for the little horn power. It had to be unshackled from any civil authority before it could be manifest. Let's trace the rise of this power from the Apostles' day until its appearance. As Christianity spread, churches were organised, and like all organisations, there were positions of power and influence. As foretold by Jesus, many came in claiming to be lambs, but were really wolves dressed up to look like lambs. Not long after the first century, Christianity lost its first love by forfeiting its purity of teaching and high standards of personal conduct. The first step taken by different church bishops and leaders was increasing their authority in their local church and then extending their authority over neighbouring churches. 
the authority of the bishops became more and more prominent. This mindset is seen early with the promotion of the monarchical bishop by Ignatius, the bishop of Antioch, in his various letters to the churches. Plainly, therefore, we ought to regard the bishop as the Lord himself. Follow your bishop as Jesus Christ followed the Father, and the presbytery as the apostles, and to the deacons pay respect as to God's commandment. He that honoureth the bishop is honoured of God. He that doeth aught without the knowledge of the bishop rendereth service to the devil. Whether these letters were written by Ignatius or another bishop, it is confirmed they existed in the early Christian era by the historian Eusebius. This mindset of power and authority continued to grow and around 180 AD, Bishop Irenaeus claimed the right of interpreting scripture belonged to the bishop. The bishops provided the only safe guide to the interpretation of scripture. As Christianity continued to grow, so did the egos of the clergy. Boasting rights among the bishops belonged to those who presided over the best cities. The respect enjoyed by the various Christian bishops in the second century was proportionate to the rank of the city in which they resided. The civil authority was a major hindrance to the developing power of the bishops, as Christianity was outlawed and punishable by death. From Emperor Nero in 64 AD to Emperor Constantine in 313, when Christianity was legalized by the Edict of Milan, Christians were often killed and persecuted by the Roman state. In 330 AD, Constantine moved the capital of the empire to Constantinople. With the emperor's support, Christianity rapidly became popular, moving out of the shadows and into the public forum. The office of the Bishop of Rome grew rapidly in importance and authority, with Constantine often advocating for the cause of the Roman bishop over that of other bishops. Now Rome was the largest, richest and most powerful city in the world. If Rome is the queen of cities, why should not her pastor be the king of bishops? Why should not the Roman church be the mother of Christendom? Why should not all nations be her children and her authority their sovereign law? It was easy for the ambitious heart of man to reason thus. Ambitious Rome did so. With the Bishop of Rome continuing to grow in power, it still had several obstacles to overcome. One of those was beliefs and doctrines that conflicted with its own. Like Rome, Alexandria of Egypt was an influential city. From it, a prominent priest named Arius was teaching a doctrine regarding the nature and divinity of Christ that was diametrically opposed to that of Rome. Although Arius was not the first to teach this doctrine, his agitation on the point caused his name to be attached to those who espoused the same teaching, giving rise to the term Arianism. The spread of Arianism threatened the upward growth of the Bishop of Rome. Rome could not ignore the threat. The Council of Nicaea in 325 was called by the Emperor Constantine I he hoped a general council of the church would solve the problem created in the Eastern Church by Arianism, a heresy first proposed by Arius of Alexandria. The emperor then exiled Arius, an act that, while manifesting a solidarity of church and state, underscored the importance of secular patronage in ecclesiastical affairs. During the Council of Sardicia in 343, 170 bishops convened to further resolve the Arian controversy. It was passed as canon law confirming the Bishop of Rome as having jurisdiction over all metropolitan bishops. Rome, eager to have opposing beliefs checked, was supported by the Emperor Theodosius, who was the last emperor to rule over both the eastern and western halves of the empire. On the 27th of February, 380, Emperor Theodosius put forward this order. It is our desire that all the various nations which are subject to our clemency and moderation should continue the profession of that religion which was delivered to the Romans by the divine apostle Peter. Let us believe in the one deity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in equal majesty and in a holy trinity. We authorize the followers of this law to assume the title Catholic Christians. But as for the others, since in our judgment they are foolish madmen, 
we decree that they shall be branded with the ignominious name of heretics. The Roman Church adopted the name Catholic, which simply means universal. The Church asserted that it had universal authority over the entire Christian world, and anyone who did not agree with her teachings was deemed a heretic. As the Ten Germanic Kingdoms established themselves in Roman territory, many had embraced Christianity. However, most were of the Arian persuasion and were regarded as heretics. Odoacer devolved on the Roman magistrates the odious and oppressive tasks of collecting the public revenue. Like the rest of the barbarians, he had been instructed in the Arian heresy, the Ostrogoths, the Burgundians, and Suevi and the Vandals, who had listened to the eloquence of the Latin clergy, preferring the more intelligible lessons of their domestic teachers. Arianism was adopted as the national faith of the warlike converts who were seated on the ruins of the Western Empire. As Imperial Rome fell, the Bishop of Rome found himself crowded in by kings who did not regard him or his doctrines. But she, the Church, fell as was inevitable into many embarrassments and found herself in an entirely altered condition. A pagan people took possession of Britain Arian kings seized the greater part of the remaining West, while the Lombards, long attached to Arianism and as neighbors most dangerous and hostile, established a powerful sovereignty before the very gates of Rome. The Roman bishops, meanwhile, beset on all sides, exerted themselves with all the prudence and pertinacity which have remained their peculiar attribute to regain the mastery, at least in their patriarchal diocese. The Bishop of Rome found himself surrounded by kings who were in opposition to the Church of Rome. With most of the kingdoms professing the Arian faith, the Franks and the Anglo-Saxons remained pagans, which was also a problem to the Little Horn power. As symbolized by the eyes of the Little Horn, the Roman Church worked with foresight and cunning to overpower the Arian kings. Meanwhile, Zeno, the emperor of the East and friend of the Pope, was anxious to drive Odoacer out of Italy. The history of Odoacer shows him to have been a wise and moderate ruler. It was only the bishop and clergy of Rome that complained of the violent suppression and tyranny, and it was doubtless at their instigation that Theodoric and Zeno planned the subjugation of the Heruli. As Jezebel promulgated lies about Naboth, so the Roman bishop underhandedly fed false reports of the lawlessness of Odoacer's rule to the Eastern Emperor. Theodoric asked the Emperor Zeno to allow him to take over Italy and destroy the tyrant Odoacer. With Zeno's approval, the Ostrogoths under their King Theodoric marched into Italy and overthrew Odoacer in 493. Being completely uprooted, his kingdom never recovered. With the Huruli out of the way, the Roman bishop was still crowded out by the newly arrived Ostrogothic kingdom, who opposed the teachings of the Catholic Church. Clovis, king of the Franks, converted to the Catholic faith in 496 and was later baptized on December 25, 508. In him, the bishop of Rome found a powerful ally to aid in the Catholic cause. Clovis greatly assisted Rome by defeating the Visigoths, pushing them out of Gaul and deep into Spain, while drastically reducing their influence as an Arian kingdom. Clovis is said to have liberated many Catholics suffering under Arian rule of the Visigoths. The Bishop of Rome ensured Clovis was highly praised and distinguished above the Arian kings. He was given the title of consul by the Eastern Emperor. When the Emperor Justinian ascended the Byzantine throne in 518, the bishop gained another valuable ally during a time when the Church of Rome was completely under the subjection of the Arian king Theodoric. In 523, Emperor Justinian, in support of the Bishop of Rome, issued an edict against Arianism, which angered King Theodoric, who expelled the Bishop of Rome to Constantinople. Emperor Justinian issued further edicts and laws between 530 and 534. These laws greatly strengthened the position of the Roman pontiff on paper, as the Arian king Theodoric
had the civil power in Rome. Justinian's key laws are as follows. Whatever the holy canons prohibit, these also we by our own laws forbid. Whenever the church passed any canon law in one of its synods, it was to be supported and enforced by civil authorities. This codex elevated the laws of the church to equality with the laws of the state. We enact the present law that the most holy pope of ancient Rome shall hold the first rank of all the pontiffs, which shall take precedence over all other sees. By law, Justinian elevated the Roman pontiff above all others. If anyone should presume to conduct religious services in his own house without the presence of any members of the clergy who are subject to the authority of the most holy bishop of the diocese, we order that the said house or land on which an offence of this kind was committed shall be claimed by the most holy bishop or his steward or the civil magistrate for the benefit of the church of that locality. We order that no heretic shall acquire any immovable property from a church or any other religious establishment. He shall lose it, and the superintendent of said establishment shall be deprived of his office, confined in a monastery and excluded from the Holy Communion for an entire year by way of punishing him for having betrayed Christians to heretics. And where a heretic, and among heretics we include a Jew, Samaritan, Arian, Nestorians, Acephali, and Eutychians, builds a house for the celebration of his worship, or a new Jewish synagogue, the most holy church of the diocese shall seize the building. We have published a sacred edict, which also your holiness knows, through which we have refuted the madness of the heretics. For neither do we permit that anything which pertains to the state of the church not be referred to his blessedness, as being head of all the holy priests of God, and because no matter how often heretics have sprung up in these villages and regions, they have been eliminated by the sentence and right judgment of that venerable see. These laws appointed the pontiff of Rome as the supreme head over all churches. They also elevated canon law to equality with civil law and appointed the papacy as the corrector of heretics. Although these powerful laws were passed by the emperor, the Bishop of Rome still had one major problem. The king who held civil power in Rome did not support these laws. In fact, the Arian king was so outraged, he told the bishop he would reciprocate these threatening edicts against the Catholics. Meanwhile, it was claimed the Catholics were being persecuted by the Aryan Vandals in Carthage, North Africa. These two powerful horns, the Ostrogoths and the Vandals, were suffocating the ambitious Roman clergy. While the Catholics were thus feeling the restraining power of an Aryan king in Italy, they were suffering a violent persecution from the Aryan Vandals in Africa. In 533, Justinian dispatched his army under the control of General Belisarius and declared war on the Vandals. Belisarius annihilated them by 534, from which they never recovered. In 535, Belisarius arrived in Sicily, declaring war against the Ostrogoths. In March 538, Belisarius defeated the Ostrogoths in a siege of Rome, freeing Rome from Ostrogothic rule. The war continued over much of mainland Italy until the Ostrogoths were finally uprooted in the spring of 555 and ultimately lost to history. The Lombards took control of the Italian mainland territories about 13 years later. After gaining Rome in 538, Justinian never appointed any civil leader to rule over the bishop. The restraining power of civil authority was gone. With the laws passed a number of years earlier, the pontiff was now a king in his own right. When the last wave of barbarian invasions had spent its force, the face of Europe had been transformed. Independent Germanic kingdoms had been established on the ruins of the Roman Empire. Out of the ruins of the Roman Empire, there gradually arose a new order of states, whose central point was the Papal See. When the Roman Empire had disintegrated, 
and its place had been taken by a number of rude, barbarous kingdoms. The Roman Catholic Church not only became independent of the state in religious affairs, but dominated secular affairs as well. Therefore, inevitably, resulted a position not only new, but different from the former. In the year 538, the Goths were driven from Rome, and at that time, the aspiring Virgilius, by his secret intrigues with the artful Theodora, was promoted to the pontifical dignity, which he purchased with 200 pounds of gold. During the pontificate of Virgilius, the pretensions of the successors of St. Peter to a general superiority began to be openly asserted, and shortly after, their supremacy was publicly acknowledged. It was at this time that the Pope assumed the title of Vicegerent of Jesus Christ. Now, too, celibacy was more generally enjoined. The use of holy water was first publicly recommended by Virgilius in 538. In 538, the Pontiff of Rome had his power and his territory with no superior. The little horn manifested itself in its place among the others, as foretold in the vision to Daniel. So far, we have seen from history this little horn has arisen out of the beast, which is Rome. It arose among ten other kingdoms also situated in the Roman territory. It is different from the other kings in that it claims universal authority over the bodies and souls of men. It subdued three kingdoms as told in the vision. It's important to note the vision states before whom three of the first were plucked up by the roots. The words before whom denotes place and not time, as in in front of the little horn, three of the first were plucked up by the roots. Those kingdoms being the Huruli in 493, the Vandals in 534, and the Ostrogoths in 555, who never rose again. Daniel saw this little horn rise to power. However, he makes the statement that his look was more stout than his fellows. Did the Roman pontiff become more stout or stronger than the other kings of Western Europe? History affirms it did. The Roman Catholic Church built many schools, universities, hospitals and monasteries throughout the territory of the other kingdoms. But its real authority was shown when the popes of Rome set up kings and removed kings from the other kingdoms, an act that is associated with the prerogative of God. A number of years after the manifestation of the little horn, Muhammad was born in Mecca, Arabia, in 570 AD. Another major world religion was born. Muhammad claimed that the angel Gabriel told him that he was the last of the prophets continuing the work of Jesus Christ and the other Abrahamic prophets. Muhammad founded the first Islamic state and by 630 conquered and unified the greater part of Arabia. After he died in 632, his adherents, known as Muslims, continued expanding their power taking Persia, Syria, Egypt and part of Asia Minor, conquering the Sassanid Empire and taking a large portion of the Byzantine Empire. By 711 AD, the Muslims invaded Spain. Within 10 years, they captured Barcelona and entered into Burgundy. The Muslims were checked in their conquest by the Franks. When the Frankish King Charlemagne ascended the throne, he was a zealous defender of Catholicism. He assisted Rome by restraining the Aryan Lombards and regaining European territory from Islamic control between 785 and 813. In his role as a zealous defender of Christianity, Charlemagne gave money and land to the Christian church and protected the popes. As a way to acknowledge Charlemagne's power and reinforce his relationship with the church, Pope Leo III crowned Charlemagne Emperor of the Romans on December the 25th 800 at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. The Roman bishop crowned Charlemagne the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. For centuries, the popes of Rome appointed and dismissed kings in Europe while waging wars against those who did not acknowledge their rule. By the authority which God has given us in the person of St. Peter, we declare you king and we order the people to render you in this capacity homage and obedience. 
We, however, shall expect you to subscribe to all our desires as a return for the imperial crown. The popes were also venerated as having supreme authority over kings. When the emperor arrived in the presence of the pope, he laid aside his imperial mantle and knelt on both knees with his breast on the earth. Pope Alexander advanced and placed his foot on his neck, while the cardinals thundered forth in loud tones, Thou shalt tread upon the cockatrice, and crush the lion and the dragon. The next day, Emperor Frederick Barbarossa kissed the feet of Alexander, and on foot led his horse by the bridle as he returned from solemn mass to the pontifical palace. This stout horn is shown to speak great words against the Most High. The word against suggests the words are in contradiction to the words of God. For example, But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. No proof is needed to know the Bishop of Rome, as well as other clergy, take the name Holy Father in direct contradiction to the words of Christ. The Church has changed many Bible teachings over its long history, and time does not allow me to present these doctrinal changes, including infant baptism, sprinkling baptism, purgatory, indulgences, the confessional, and many more. Suffice to say, the Roman Church claims infallibility and to be above the Bible. It is evident that the popes can neither be bound or unbound by any earthly power, nor even by that of the Apostle Peter, if he should return upon earth. Since Constantine the Great has recognized that the pontiffs held the place of God on earth, divinity not being able to be judged by any living man, we are then infallible, and whatever may be our acts, we are not accountable for them, but to ourselves. It is necessary to salvation to believe that every human being is subject to the pontiff of Rome. The angel told Daniel the little horn would think to change times and laws. It's common practice for one power to change the civil or secular laws of another earthly government. But the angel said he shall think to change times and laws, which suggests these laws are in fact unchangeable laws. The law of God written with his own finger and given to humanity as his moral standard. The Ten Commandments requires supreme love to God via the first four commandments and love to our fellow man via the last six. The law of God is the foundation of the New Testament or covenant in which God promises to write its principles in our heart through the power of new birth and conversion to Christ. This law, the little horn, sought to change. The Catholic Ten Commandments, as recorded in the Catechism, are different to those recorded in Exodus 20. The second commandment of creating and worshipping graven images is removed, and the tenth divided into two. It has been claimed that the Church of Rome received their list of commandments from St. Augustine, claiming the difference is only that of numbering. His argument for doing so is that the second was covered in the first. That aside, the Church of Rome does openly claim to have changed the meaning of the fourth commandment. Two months after the Roman Church was freed from civil authority in May of 538, a synod was convened in Orleans where the Church mandated Sunday as the Lord's Day. The law forbade unnecessary work on that day and according to Justinian's edict, this dogma also passed into civil law. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, AD 364, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Christians should not Judaize and should not be idle on the Sabbath but should work on that day. They should, however, particularly reverence the Lord's Day, and if possible, not work on it, because they were Christians. 
Christians are exhorted to fast on Friday and the Sabbath for what the Jews did to Christ, but to eat and make good cheer, and rejoice and be glad on Sunday, because that, the earnest of our resurrection, Christ is risen. Like many Christians today, Rome taught that the Sabbath belonged to the Jews. And considering the Jews were labelled heretics and punishable by the church, it follows that they needed to separate themselves. Sabbath was to be a fasting day, while Sunday was to be a day of celebration. In reality, the seventh day Sabbath was first instituted at the end of creation week. The day was blessed and set aside by God for all descendants of Adam. Well before any Jews existed, God ordained it to be a memorial day to reflect on His creative power. For this reason, the fourth commandment started with the word, Remember. The Roman church did not have the mind to remember the power of God, but instead boasted changing God's law from Sabbath to Sunday was proof it had power over God. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Anyone who dared disobey the church, even if it conflicted with the plain written word of God, was branded a heretic. Anyone with a conscience contradicting the laws of Rome became its prey. Rome made war with the saints, and according to the vision, prevailed against them. The angel explained the saints would be given into his hands for a specified period. This is perfectly fulfilled by the church being given the right to persecute heretics and the removal of the final civil restraint of the Ostrogoths in 538. This is the beginning of the time, times and the dividing of time. It didn't take long for Rome to start killing those who did not yield to it. Charlemagne was praised by Rome and given the title Defender of the Faith after persecuting the Saxons. Pope Nicholas I praised the Catholic King of Bulgaria for murdering those who did not submit to Rome. I glorify you for having maintained your authority by putting to death those wandering sheep who refused to enter the fold. And you not only have not sinned by showing a holy rigor, but I even congratulate you upon having opened the kingdom of heaven to the people submitted to your rule. A king need not fear to command massacres when these will retain his subjects in obedience or cause them to submit to the faith of Christ, and God will reward him in this world and in eternal life for these murders. Rome was only beginning its war on the saints. Under Catholic rule, Europe descended into a dark age of horror as this terrifying beast shed the blood of millions with its stout horn. In 1209, the Albigensian Crusade began and was waged against those who based their beliefs and practices on the gospel rather than on Roman dogma. Thousands of crusaders went against unarmed towns and villages, killing entire settlements, leaving none alive at the order of the papal legate. In Innocent's view, it was more wicked for the Albigensians to call him the Antichrist than for him to prove it by burning them, men, women, and children, in their thousands. But blackest in the black catalogue of crime, most horrible among the fiendish deeds of all the dreadful centuries, was the St. Bartholomew Massacre. The world still recalls with shuddering horror the scenes of that most cowardly and cruel onslaught. The King of France, urged on by Romish priests and prelates, led his sanction to the dreadful work. A bell, tolling at dead of night, was a signal for the slaughter. Protestants by the thousands, sleeping quietly in their homes, trusting to the plighted honour of their king, were dragged forth without a warning and murdered in cold blood. The slaughter continued well into the 16th century, as the Sabbath-keeping Waldenses were mercilessly cut down. How could one forget the Piedmont Massacre of the year 1655? On January the 25th of this year, the Duke of Savoy gave an edict that the Waldenses must convert to the Catholic faith or leave the valleys and have their properties confiscated within a few days. If they did not leave, they were subject to a death decree. The edict was given in the middle of winter. On April the 17th, 
15,000 soldiers invaded the valleys of the Piedmont. Thousands of Waldenses were murdered, tortured, and enslaved. Hundreds who were able to get to the most rugged areas of the mountains were caught and thrown off the jagged cliff of Mount Cataluzzo near Torre Pellice. Many Christians were glad when colonization began in North America in the early 16th century. The new land was an opportunity to escape the death grip Rome had on Protestants. In 1789, the working class of France, suffering poor conditions and food shortages, became resentful of the privileges enjoyed by the aristocracy and the Catholic clergy. The people executed King Louis XVI, and among many other things, they abolished religion, even creating a 10-day week in an attempt to de-Christianize society. The Catholic clergy were heavily persecuted over their influence in public policy and the continual tithing the church required from the poor. During the revolution, a shift of power occurred. The Catholic priests became employees of the state of France. The clergy could not accept this new law because it denied the authority of the Roman pontiff over the French church. As tensions built, it gave way to the reign of terror in which over 16,500 people were massacred, including many church officials. Napoleon gained power in France and was set on removing the power from the Roman pontiff. On February 10, 1798, the French general Berthier entered Rome and in the presence of a large crowd on the 15th, Berthier signed a document announcing the end of the secular power of the Roman pontiff. The General-in-Chief of the French Army in Italy declares in the name of the French Republic that he acknowledges the Roman Republic independent and that the same is under the special protection of the French Army. In consequence, every other temporal authority emanating from the old government of the Pope is suppressed and it shall no more exercise any function. The Roman Republic, acknowledged by the French Republic, comprehends all the country that remained under the temporal authority of the Pope after the Treaty of Campo Formio. No longer were the saints given into the hands of Rome. The French decree had been given, and the end of the period given by the angel had occurred. For exactly 1,260 years, Rome had the civil right to persecute the saints. Justinian gave it, and Napoleon took it away. When considering the specified time the saints would be given into the hands of the little horn, the time, times and dividing of time need to be understood in the context of Daniel's understanding. Daniel chapter 7 was originally written in Aramaic. The Aramaic word time is idan and is often translated as year in other instances. The word times denotes multiple to us. However, the Aramaic word times is a duplicity and represents two. Also, the dividing of time is simply a half. Therefore, it is reasonable to understand the time as three and a half years in a prophetic context. Ezekiel was prophesying in Babylon in the time of Daniel and was instructed by God to prophesy to his people using physical symbolism, during which God appointed a day to symbolize a year. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah, Forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. This day for a year principle is further consolidated in Daniel chapter 9 when the angel tells Daniel that 70 weeks of years are determined upon thy people. Culturally, Daniel understood a year to be 360 days. Three and a half years times 360 days equals 1,260 years. The exact time given by the angel and confirmed perfectly by history. While the nations of Western Europe and the Little Horn power continue, it no longer has the civil right to be the corrector of heretics. The nature of the beast has not changed, so the Little Horn power has been forced to return to its clandestine methods of exerting its power. So far, we have seen 2,400 years of greed for power and authority, resulting in bloodshed and slaughter. Yet these prophecies show that even in the seeming chaos of history, God's plan was still unfolding, preparing the world for His ultimate purpose, the salvation of mankind and the establishment of His kingdom. Jesus said, 
that if we doubt earthly things, how could we believe heavenly things? With these prophecies, we have seen the incredibly clear reaction of history to prophecy. Now the vision changes to heavenly things. But the judgment shall sit, and the kingdom and dominion, and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Now the vision brings to our attention the activities of heaven. Although out of human sight, this judicial activity conducted by the Ancient of Days is as real as the existence of the nations in our world today. Daniel sees in vision the little horn speaking great things against the Most High, followed by the judgment scene. The angel explains that the saints would be given into his hands for 1,260 years, then the judgment would begin. The result of the judgment is the beast would be slain by fire. So accordingly, we understand this judgment takes place sometime after the end of the 1260 years in 1798 and before the destruction of the fourth beast and its horns at the end of this earth's history. This is further confirmed according to the parallel vision given to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. When speaking about the divisions of Rome into the European powers, it states, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. In other words, the judgment of God begins while the nations of this world exist as we know them today, but after 1798. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. Some have thought the casting down of the thrones meant the beast was destroyed, and then the Ancient of Days sat in judgment. But that is simply not the case. An execution does not happen until a judgment is passed. The text reads, the thrones were cast down, which is literally set in place. In this fiery scene, the Ancient of Days, with an enormous host surrounding him, and everything set in place, the vision states the books were opened. It should be obvious that no court can function without law, for it defines the duty of man, while penalties are enforced for its violation. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. As we have seen in history, the ravenous beasts symbolize the fallen nature of mankind manifested in the different kingdoms of this world. Every bit of pain and suffering in this world can be traced to the exercise of selfish desire. It is this beast-like nature in each of us that has poisoned our best efforts to establish harmonious authority in this world. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season in time. The judgment passed sentence on the fourth beast, which will be destroyed soon. Verse 12 states that the other beasts had their dominion taken away, but their lives prolonged. This means, as each of the kingdoms represented by the beasts fell to the next, they each left a legacy that has shaped our world. Babylon's stamp on our world is that of spiritualism, idolatry, astrology and cultic religion. Persia is the foundation of domination through global economy and worldwide trade. Grisha left to our world philosophy, higher education, sports, theatre and art. The life of these beasts continued after they fell. However, when the fourth beast is destroyed in the flames, it will have no influence in the new kingdom of Christ. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. The other purpose of this judgment is giving the kingdom of this world to the Son of Man and those who belong to Him and therefore affects every person who has ever lived. It separates those who are Christ's and those who are not. What are these books opened in judgment? 
God has informed humanity via the written word that these books contain our life story, our tears, feelings and sufferings, all our words and all our deeds, whether they are good or bad, everything about us has been uploaded to heaven and is open before God. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. It is a solemn and even disturbing thought that everything about us is open to the judge. And it certainly is if you don't know the character of the judge and don't have a barrister to advocate on your behalf. It is for this reason the judgment involves the Son of Man. After these books are opened and the judgment has started, the vision states, One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. According to God's own word, because he loved us so much, Jesus, who was equal with God, was incarnate and born as a human. With an earthly mother and the Ancient of Days as his father, he personally defeated our fallen nature, being tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sinning. He conquered our beast-like fallen nature, becoming the spotless Lamb of God, and had our sins laid upon him, dying on the cross. Death could not hold him. His perfect life broke the power of death, the devil, and sin. He ascended to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit to implant his lamb-like nature into any who will open their hearts and minds to his word. This is the sole reason he commissioned his word be preached to every nation, culture, language, and people. It is in this context the Son of Man appears before his Father. He comes before this supreme court as our barrister. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. As Jesus stands before the Father, he presents the evidence that those he represents have subjected themselves to his law, have confessed their violations of his law, and have surrendered their life to Christ. Jesus continues to prove that his people willingly consented to have the law of God planted in them as a new nature. Jesus then shows their new nature is developing or has developed into full maturity. Christ proves to the judge that the mature nature he has implanted is after his likeness, obedient, loving and selfless. As each case is brought up in the judgment, a decision is made for either life or death. Those who have Christ have life. As the judgment progresses, the kingdom of Christ becomes consolidated. The vision clearly states, And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Considering the judgment is so important to mankind, wouldn't God want to tell the world? The answer is, He is. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven, and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. The next few verses describe the destruction of the little horn power, after which it describes the people of God today. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is the message the judge wants all to know. We are over 200 years since 1798, and it would be wise to acknowledge that the hour of his judgment has come. Therefore, worship God who made the heaven and earth. Take the time on God's memorial day of creation to get to know the Creator and His power. Submit to the law of God and confess your violations and consent to have Christ's nature implanted in your life by His Word. God has meticulously crafted these prophecies so you can have an expected end. God loves you, He created you, and He wants you in His glorious kingdom.